is Geometry 5.1, When Are Figures Congruent? In Chapter 4, we discussed how reflections preserved angle measure between is collinearity and distance. And then we introduced the term isometry, which is a reflection or a composite of reflections. So it would make sense that if we have one reflection or a composite of reflections, we would still be preserving the angle measure between is collinearity and distance. So that's where our ABCD theorem comes into play. At the same time, we also discussed how our figures had the same size and same shape, and that leads us to our definition of congruent figures. We have three definitions. It's all saying the same thing, but just using different terms, but all of these terms really are similar. So let's take a look at the first one. Two figures, F and G, are congruent figures written. F is congruent to G if and only if G is the image of F under an isometry. So meaning, if we took F and we reflected it, we rotated it, translated it, or had it performed a glide reflection, they would be congruent figures. Now in the, de the next one, it says two figures, F and G, are congruent figures if and only if G is the image of F under a composite of reflections. Well, that's just the same as what we've set up above, but we have also defined isometry as a composite of reflections. And then the third definition goes so far as to just name the different types of um, composite of reflections. So the rotation, translation, glide reflection, and then just the basic reflection. So we have three different definitions of congruent figures, all saying the same thing, just using different terminology to help us remember or think about congruent figures. Since isometries are, are tied to congruence, we now say that isometries can also be called a congruence transformation. Now let's talk about the orientation of our figures and how we name them in terms of congruence. If something has the same orientation, something that has been translated or rotated, we say that they are direct, directly congruent. Here we look like it looks as though A to B might be a rotation, so we say they're directly congruent to each other. On the opposite side here, we have a two figures that are oppositely congruent, and we know that when we have reflections and glide reflections, our figures have the opposite orientation. So if we look at B, it looks like we've had a reflection followed by a translation, so that would be called a glide reflection, and we know they have opposite orientation, so we say they are oppositely congruent. Now some of the transformations that we have studied do not preserve angle measure between us, collinearity and distance. They are not congruence transformations. Those are size changes that we studied in chapter three. And then another one that we have studied in maybe a previous course or you may study later in chapter four of advanced algebra and that's called a shear. And in this case, our distance is not preserved and angle measure is not preserved. So they are not congruent figures and they, they are not considered to be congruence transformations. As we study congruent figures, I'd like to also talk about some properties of congruence. Let's take a look at the first one. That's called the reflexive property. If I reflect F over line M, and then I reflect it back, F has to be congruent to F by definition of congruence. Let's next look at the symmetric property of congruence. If I reflect F over multiple lines, over L and over M here, then F would be congruent to G. And then if I take G and I reflect it back over line M and then over line L, G would have to be congruent to F. So that's where the symmetric property comes from. The third one is called the transitive property of congruence. We've studied that in terms of equality and inequality. Now we're going to look at it in terms of congruence. If I do a composite of reflections to have F map onto G, that means F and G have to be congruent to each other. And then if I perform another composite reflection and have G map onto H, that means G and H need to be congruent to each other. Well, if F is congruent to G and G is congruent to H, then that means that H would have to be congruent to F because F could then be mapped onto H. So we therefore have the transitive property of congruence. These properties will become very important to you as we study chapter five and we work on proving that figures are congruent to each other. 
Now I'd like you to stop the video and try the set of examples that are on the following page. I'd like you to do one, two, and three, four, five, and six, and then seven through nine. When you've had an opportunity to try them, start the video again, and I will go through the examples with you. As you look at the Australian flag here on the right, you notice that its relationship to number one has the same orientation. They're directly congruent to each other, and they're just an example of a rotation. The image here is rotated to match up with the image in number one. If you look at number two, they are clearly not the same size, so they are not congruent to each other, neither oppositely or directly, and you can tell that there's been a size change transformation performed here. If you look at number three, those are oppositely congruent flags and they have had a reflection performed. As we look at four through six, we want to determine if the figures are congruent or not congruent in these situations. If a bricklayer buys 50 bricks to repair some bricks, the bricks would need to be congruent. He's buying the same size and shape brick. Or an artist makes 30 brass candlesticks from a mold. The can candlesticks would then be congruent because all the candlesticks are being made out of the same mold. Now let's look at number six. A, a child assembles a jigsaw puzzle. We know that all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit very nicely together. However, each puzzle piece is not the same exact size or the same shape, so they, we would say that they are not congruent. In seven through, seven through nine, we wanted to use one of the properties of congruence to justify the statement that's being made. We know that two figures, if an isometry has been performed, they would be con um, the same figure, this C, would be congruent to C, so that's the reflexive, reflexive property. Look at number eight. If AB is congruent to PQ and PQ is congruent to YZ, since PQ is congruent to both AB and YZ, then it would make sense that AB is congruent to YZ. That's the transitive property of congruence. And then the last one is the symmetric property of congruence. If the quadrilateral is congruent to four, or if quad is congruent to four, then four would need to be congruent to quad. 